When we runners talk about running, or let's be real, when we evangelize about it, we talk a lot about how democratic it is. All you need are shoes. But it's not really that simple. You're going to want gear, which costs money. Then there's the issue of actual physical space. You want sidewalks that aren't jagged, trails that aren't overgrown, air that's clean enough to breathe, so ideally you don't live there in landfills or power plants or factories. So yeah, all you need are shoes and space and money and time, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and you also need something from the people around you, the sense that you belong in that space. Women don't always get that luxury. And neither do runners of color. So why has it been easier to talk about runner safety for women? <clears throat> but until recently, it's been much harder to talk about safety for runners of color. I'm Gene Demby, that's me, running, And this is a video episode of Code Switch. I definitely don't run at night. I, I The other day, I was it was like 7 o'clock. Um, and then I thought to myself, I was like, oh my God, what time does the sun go down, though? Because I need to be back. I, I felt like I was like, Cinderella, this is that double consciousness. Those are the kinds of conversations that were happening in the black and brown community, um, you know, in the news of in the wake of, of Ahmaud Arbery. Allison Desir is a runner, activist, and founder of multiple groups that use running for social change. Yeah, so the runner safety movement is now, I believe, in its second year. It emerged after there were um, two murders of white women runners. Um, runners World then did uh, a I think a whole issue around women and runner safety and women sharing stories. But a key piece that was missing in none of these conversations were they talking about sexism, patriarchy, white supremacy, like the systemic issues. So everything was sort of talking about what is the individual's responsibility because um, society is what it is. And, and for me, that that's just not enough. After national news broke about two white men killing Ahmaud Arbery, Allison and other runners of color publicly posed that big question about safety for runners of color. My initial call out was to Runner's World, like where, this is a runner's, this is a story about a runner, right? So where are you on this story? After people started posting the pictures of them running 2.23 miles, you know, in, in, in memoriam, and that took off, but I didn't see much of a discussion of kind of the underlying history and the structural factors which contributed to this case. Hint, hint, it has something to do with whiteness. So let's backpedal some. In the decades after the Second World War, there was an explosion of the new middle class, the new white middle class. People were in office jobs, sitting at their desks. People were driving cars. Food was cheaper than ever. Concerned experts, like President Kennedy, saw the rise in pulmonary illnesses and heart attacks as related to this new sedentary way of life. And so, in 1966, a track and field coach named Bill Bowerman from Oregon and a cardiologist wrote a book called Jogging that trumpeted the benefits of getting out and jogging. That book sold a million copies and set off what would become the jogging craze. Oh, a few years later, Bowerman would go on to start a little shoe company called Nike. The lily white state of Oregon, by the way, the only state that was admitted to the union with a charter that explicitly barred black people from living there, soon became the epicenter of America's new jogging craze. What I'm saying is that the whiteness of that original kind of founding culture is reflected in the way that Nike was promoting run. Um, and even that book, Jogging, where if you look at the pictures throughout, it's a kind of archetypal white runner. It's like, I don't want to um, overstate in some ways the fact that like only white people wanted to jog and, and black people didn't. What you see in looking through kind of, you know, many mainstream African-American publications throughout the 70s is articles about jogging and running and other forms of exercise, which are not about the kind of political stakes or the dangers of it, but about like, hey, this is a way we can build community. This is a way we can get healthy because heart disease and diabetes are actually overrepresented in African-American communities. That said, over the next decade, running became more inextricably coded as white. 
So in the late 70s and early 80s, you have this notion of the jogger as being what came to be called a yuppie by the early 1980s. So this is a kind of upwardly mobile professional who cares about their health, who has enough money to kind of buy nice things, who has leisure time that they're spending doing like laudable activities, like working on their health. After that, I mean, there, there are important turning points, but no one's really talking about jogging so much anymore. You hear more this kind of, I'm a runner, I'm athletic. Amateur race culture really picks up where people are signing up for races even if they were never athletes. It's part of, you know, a broader culture, which is, I think, pretty obsessed with fitness and running being one aspect um, or one facet of that obsession. The 1989 Central Park jogging case, I think, is a really important moment. You may know this moment as the Central Park Five case. In 1989, a woman, she was working at an investment bank, a white woman was running in Central Park, was attacked, raped, ostensibly left for dead. There was media hysteria, and there was a huge public outcry calling for justice that resulted in the wrongful conviction of five teenage boys of color. One part of that media hysteria was this full-page ad promoting the death penalty for those five wrongfully accused boys, paid for by Donald Trump. In 2002, these charges were vacated for all five now-grown men. And I think that that has continued to shape um, conversations about running culture more broadly, that the quintessentially vulnerable runner is always pretty much cast as a white woman. And as a white woman, I can tell you that's real. But there's been no corresponding conversation about um, the concerns that people of color face. And if anything, the conversation has often positioned people of color as the threat to white people running. And I think that's a major oversight that maybe Ahmaud Arbery's death is beginning to lay bare for a lot of people who hadn't paid attention to that before. Folks like to say that like for running, all you need is a pair of sneakers. And I think being in this space, um, I know that there's so much more to that. First of all, feeling like you can be comfortable moving. And what's really important to me in these communities is showing a diverse range of bodies, a diverse range of faces, but I found that the more I do it, the more folks jump on board. Police killed George Floyd on Memorial Day in Minneapolis. You know the story from here. And across the country, protesters laid claim to public space to speak out against systemic injustices, especially police brutality. Note, one of the two men who killed Ahmaud Arbery is a former police officer. It's a reminder that taking up space is inherently political and racialized, whether we're talking about protests or civil disobedience or something as simple as running. If you want in on fearless conversations about race, check out our podcast, Code Switch, at npr.org slash Code Switch. I'm Gene Demby. Be easy, y'all.